Hello everyone, welcome to the solution to problems of cost-benefit analysis concepts and practice by Boardman, Greenberg, Vining and Weimer. Chapter 2. The team is Suvranil and Adam. Hi everyone, so we're going to walk through question 1 from the chapter 2 exercises. Um, and so for the first question, the key thing that we want to remember is that for Pareto, uh, whenever there's an alternative, that alternative needs to be at the same cost or lower for every single individual um, for it to be Pareto improving, uh, which is also the same as saying that uh, it needs to benefit everybody or nobody needs to be uh, any worse off for making the change. So in regards to VHS and Betamax, um, as we can see in the explanation that we have written here on the slide, there would be a cost uh, associated with switching technologies, which is just w what happens whenever we switch technologies. Um, and so that why it doesn't really seem likely in this scenario that this switch from VHS or from Betamax to VHS would be Pareto improving. So this question deals with willingness to pay um, that concept and it asks a couple questions about what would be the most you'd be willing to pay for a ticket um, or the most you'd be willing to accept to give up the ticket in different scenarios. Um, so I think the main, the main point is that the difference between scenarios one and two, what is the most you'd be willing to pay for a ticket and if you won the ticket, what is the smallest amount you would accept to give up? Uh, the difference is what we call the willing, the difference between the willingness to pay and the willingness to accept. And what this really does is this just is a reflection of, on consumer theory and really how we perceive gains um, versus how we perceive losses. And really the idea is that the wealthier a person is, they're going to be more willing to pay for more expensive goods. Whereas conversely, the less income or the less wealth that a person has, the more likely or more preferential they're going to be um, to giving up their money for a material good or item. Question three deals with measuring opportunity cost um, for a given list of government scenarios uh, for government expenditures. So the first one, uh, time of jurors in a criminal justice program, we would say that even though jurors are, you know, most likely going to receive some sort of stipend for their food and travel costs um, and their time away from work, at least for most jurors uh, and in most, most location, this stipend still is not going to be enough to make up for the lost wages that these, these jurors could have been making um, at their regular job. Assuming they're employed, uh, if they're unemployed, then that opportunity cost is going to be what they could have been doing while they weren't in court, right? So if they could have been at the park or walking their dog, um, that would, for unemployed workers, that would be the opportunity cost um, for their time. And then you can see uh, the rest of the scenarios as well in the slides. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting and wanted to point out was the scenario that's asking about concrete that was previously poured as part of a bridge foundation um, and I think the idea behind this one is that uh, once the concrete really is set I mean given the nature of concrete once it's poured and once it's set then there really is no longer any useful value or any opportunity cost for it because you can't really do anything with concrete once it's been poured and dried um, so that is something to take into account whenever we're looking at opportunity cost, if there is a, even is an opportunity cost available. Uh, so that was just one thing that I thought was interesting and wanted to bring to, uh, bring to mind when going through this problem. Moving on to question four. The problem wants us to compare four projects R, F, and W with or without a road connectivity and the standalone road. If we look at the benefit cost ratio, project W has the maximum benefit compared to cost at around 5. If we analyze the net benefits, however, project R along with the road have the net benefits of 12 million and hence should be selected based on CBA rule.
Next, we are evaluating the CBA for US Navy forward base. The analyst performs the CBA in a scenario which doesn't capture monetary value of all impacts. This could better be structured as a multi-goal analysis with the goals being maximizing efficiency, reducing risk of surprise attacks or impacts from regime changes. CBA here can be used as an evaluation tool instead of a decision tool. Moving on to the next question on the benefits of surveillance. There are three parties involved, the jewelers, city or the taxpayers and robbers. The net benefit depends on whether robbers have a standing or not. Since robbers are a part of the society, we should consider their costs when computing net benefits. Then the net benefit stands at a negative $200,000. However, since the surveillance is aimed at detracting the robbers, it would be appropriate to not give them a standing. Then the net benefit of the surveillance is $400,000. Question seven uh, deals with the spreadsheet regarding the cost benefit analysis for an anti antibiotic regulatory program uh, in the United States. So the template was provided to us in the problem and then just using the, uh, the information given, I filled out the table uh, with the following costs as you can see. Um, the net benefits is just the total U.S. benefits minus the total U.S. costs, um, which we can see as is, is negative 20 million, uh, meaning there is a net cost of 20 million. Um, and I think in the second part of the problem, that fraction counted as U.S. benefits, really what we're doing there is we're just taking uh, a given fraction, say it's an eighth or a fourth or whatever it is, that percentage, and we're going to be multiplying that times the avoided non-US resistant co resistance costs, which is that 280 million figure you can see in the table. So we're multiplying the fraction of that 200 times that 280 million, and then we're just adding that to the net benefits. Um, so in our little write-up description on the slide, you can see that when that fraction counted as U.S. benefits, when that's 7.14%, it's going to bring our U.S. net benefits to zero. So anything above 7.14% of the fraction of non-U.S. resistance costs that are counted as U.S. benefits, anything above that percentage number is going to put the program into positive, uh, positive benefits. It's going to make them net positive over the course of the program.